All right, so uh, thank you. And ignore uh, the title for now, because I want to start out with a historical story that begins in 1774, the Treaty of uh, Kuchuk Kainarka, I think I'm pronouncing that right, um, that ended, or that was the treaty that helped uh, end the uh, Russo-Ottoman War. So the Ottomans being right around here in Turkey, Russians being up here. And the key to this is that the Austrians, the, Austri the Austrian Empire swooped in at the last minute on the side of the victorious Russians, which um, permitted them to gain a little bit of territory in this treaty. So the Russians are, you know, kind of, as you, they're in yellow, they're kind of swooping in down here. This used to all be Ottoman territory for a couple centuries after the Ottomans started to spread in the 15th century. Slowly, you know, the, by the 18th century, the Ottoman Empire is starting to recede. And by being, uh, by aligning themselves with the Austrians, uh, the, uh, or with the Russians, the Austrians get to this territory of Bukovina, which is the outlined in red up here. This used to be Ottoman territory, and in 1774, it gets ceded to the Austrians. Now, put this uh, dot up here for, this is a, part of modern-day Romania, known as the Udesht Commune. And this is going to be the center of our talk today, and I'll tell you why this place is interesting, or at least I think it's interesting right now. All right, so in 1777, as this territory is being incorporated into the Austrian Empire, one of the major landowners, uh, Ruxenda Stirbet, was uh, called to submit this oath. Say that all the landowners did, not just in, in the entire of Bukovina, which was you know, the entire area ceded to the, uh, to the Austrians to submit, this, uh, to submit her oath, and she refused. So this entire area right around here uh, goes into Ukraine and Mold uh, modern-day Moldova, was, is uh, known as uh, Moldavia. And she viewed this as a crippling of her society, whatnot. And you know, one thing you should note here, too, is that the Judeshi Commune is just on the border, right? It's just, I mean, just exactly on the border. So she said, all right, now this is ridiculous. I'm going to move on the other side of this creek, and this is not part of your territory. Fine. This, um, was, uh, this other side of the creek was kind of this unclaimed land, unproductive land. There were a couple widows living on it. That's about it. And then the Austrians kind of said, fine, this wasn't something you know, that they had really thought much about. So in 1786, this manifests itself, and they just put their border stone on the right side of the creek. So here's what this modern day commune looks like. This is taken off Google Maps. So this is a river right here, which kind of forms the natural border between, um, well, what was then Ottoman, the Ottoman Empire and the Austrian Empire. She moved her, her, her and her uh, corvée across the creek. Now this is something that, again, this was not really something that the, Ottoman, or the, the Austrians really cared about. It was unproductive land. She moved them over here, and as you can see, this is, these, are, these are three modern towns, which will come back, or modern communes. They're all still quite small um, in terms of, you know, there's about a, less than 1,000 households in each. As you can see, this, this commune still holds her name, well, slightly altered to Stirbat. And she decided that this would be Ottoman, or not Ottoman, but part of Moldavia, and they, they were fine. They agreed. They put a border stone here. They even put a, a border station on this creek because this, uh, this was the border between the Austrian Empire and the Ottoman Empire. All right. So I'm going to give you a little more history of this commune and tell you why, then tell you what, why I, what's going on here. Why, why, I'm, why am I talking about this? So along with her, her and her, you know, her corvée, there, was some, there were some people that then moved that had similar, similar interests to her, essentially kind of, they didn't want to be part of the Austrian Empire, they moved across the border. This happened in the late 18th century, so by the late 18th century, this, and this is still rather small, we still have maybe 30 households at most. Um, the rest of the commune, so all of the, all of the pink, Stayed under Austrian control until 1919, after World War I, when the Austrian-Hungarian Empire was you know, broken apart, and all of this became part of Romania. All right. On the other hand, Moldavia, um, which was the part of this map that held this one, this one little village in this commune. Again, this, this, that, this village today, Stirbat, has about 300 households. It's still small. Fell under various rulers after the Treaty of 
uh, the, after the treaty, you know, all of which were, you know, especially in um, the 19th century, were not exactly the, we would think, of, you know, th these are really autocratic rulers. Um, they did come under Romanian rule. Um, 1950, so after 1919, again, these are all, they're, it's all Romania after 1919. In 1950, this, you know, the, now you have a, a communist government in Romania that brings them all into one commune, which they've more or less stayed in since, even after the fall of communism, it's still called the Udesh commune. And there's 11 villages in the commune as a whole. So some, so, so slightly more again, there's 11 villages in this quite small, uh, you know, modern day commune, that's the way it's uh, organized. This one village, Stierbat, fell under non-Austrian rule for 144 years, the rest fell under Austrian rule. Um, these differences, are really kind of this, oh, not historical accident, it's not an accident in a sense, but it, it's idiosyncratic, I think. One could clearly make that argument. So this one landowner who had, you know, interest, and then it wasn't, but it really wasn't her in a sense. It was, you know, she brought people over that were somewhat forced. This is still a, a time where much labor, you know, there's still significant forced labor in this uh, part of Europe. Um, and moreover, this commune has been reunified for about 100 years now. All right, so they've experienced a lot under one kind of common set of institutions. A world war, a communist, post-communist era. So this is a cool story, I guess. <laughs> That's my, um, all right, but who cares? All right, so this is, you know, you might, this is, uh, this is a very narrow, this is one little commune that's, you know, that I think, uh, you know, when we did, the, when we did our, our work here, you know, I, it was very clear that they were not used to um, researchers coming into their commune. So, uh, why are we why are we caring about this? What is this What is this story? What do we do? What is this going to tell us? All right. So now taking the step back, normally you kind of give your motivation early. I thought maybe giving the history first might give you an idea about exactly what we are doing. And the kind of broader economics of cultural literature is you know identifying culture. We have an idea that culture matters. And there are plenty of papers that take pretty clever, clever uh, means in one way or another to try to identify culture as unique rather than some other type of stimuli, whether it be economic, maybe political, you know, institutional. All of these things we, we kind of know interact, which make it very difficult to identify culture because you know, culture feeds into institutions. So what, how, do we, how do we separate culture from these other things? So this is what we try to do in this paper. We're going to use this, what we're con viewing is about as close to a natural experiment as you can get in terms of, you know, kind of creating borders like this. And now, I, I shouldn't say as you can get, because there are a lot of borders which, you know, like, so the scramble for Africa or something is a great example of borders that, you know, that have been, you know, exploited significantly by economists and political scientists to, to kind of look at, you know, because these were created in a, you know, European boardroom, so they're not based on anything necessarily endogenous to the area. But, you know, there's many parts, other parts of the world where we can really start getting identification in terms of stuff that might lead to culture being transmitted over time. So in the economics literature, you know, and to some extent in the political science literature as well, I, the three primary ways that empirical works have tried to identify culture as something distinct from something else. You might, you might think of using instrumental variables, which is, of course is a hot thing to do in economics in terms of getting identification. Um, Another important recent set of studies have used regression discontinuities generally over borders like we're going to do here, where you, know, you look at either side of a border or you, you, know, you look for discontinuities in terms of what something you might expect to be different on the other side of the border. And then there's also lab or field experiments which go in and try to look at maybe cultural differences, you know, the kind of the famous like, North Italy versus South Italy type of experiments. All right, now there are issues with each of these. So all three of these certainly bring a lot in terms of, we're not, by no means in this paper, we're not saying they're, that they're bad or that these studies are bumpkins because they do bring a lot. They, they advance what we can think about in terms of trying to isolate culture. But with each of these, and including our own experiment, we recognize there are downsides as well. So in instrumental variables, for example, if, you know, there are always difficulties in finding an appropriate instrument, and if you have an IV paper and you go to an economics seminar, you're probably going to have half your seminar be about your instrument and trying to say whether it you know, satisfies exclusion restrictions or whatnot. Even if you find a perfect instrument, 
that all this does is remove the bias. You know, you have to still have a quite convincing story about the pathway. And you know, a lot of the a lot of these papers do just you know look at something that happened a long time ago, look at something today, and you know, the, there, there's very there's you know the, the IV doesn't solve how you get from A to B. It just suggests that you know this is an unbiased coefficient. Now, regression discontinuity somewhat addresses this because we, you know, we're thinking that all right, there's a reason I'm looking at over this discontinuity. But as, uh, except, for, you know, except for a few well-studied cases, such as I mentioned, you know, like the scramble for Africa is a pretty, I think, good case of this. Discontinu or discontinuities, especially those that rely on borders, which are most of them in this literature, are generally not fully exogenous. Most borders are created for a reason, whether it be, sometimes it's geographical, but even then ge ge geography might be playing a role independent of the border. Uh, it might be military advantage, it might be economic interests. And when, these, when, when this is true, and you no longer have a truly exogenous border, you know, we don't really know what's doing the work here. Now, there are ways to kind of address this, but you know, they, they, often leave, they often leave a lot to be desired. Um, laboratory field experiments you know, address some of these issues while having other issues of their own. Now, namely, um, you know, unless extremely cleverly designed, have difficulty of isolating cultural determinants versus you know, more broader institutional or economic determinants. So there's you know, some recent papers that do look at you know, people from different parts of, of countries where there's cultures that are different, cultural differences that are known known to be had, but you know, there are plenty of other differences between these different parts of the country as well. So what we're going to try to do in this paper is address a lot of these shortcomings with a study where, you know, just to be quite upfront, there are some other shortcomings of our study. Namely, it's going to be a fairly low-end study, but what we're going to do, just you know, to also be very clear, I think, is complement these studies. Come up with, come up with a, a way of addressing a lot of these shortcomings while um, while providing some insights. So what we do in order to do this is we combine a lab in the field experiment in this Udesh commune with a natural experiment, namely this historical border difference that we view as you know, re, you know, reasonably exogenous to 20, you know, 20th century or 21st century um, uh, cultural attributes, namely the one we look at because we didn't want to really um, invent stuff on the, uh, or push the margins of experimental economics. We want to use some traditional economic games that we might think have a reason to be different over these, these borders. And I'll tell you why the border might be, um, uh, cause differences in a second. So we run trust games on opposite sides of these border. We went into, or we had a group go into uh, the Udesh commune on opposite sides of the border to the three villages that I showed you before and play trust games. All right, so the primary challenges, I think, in general, with identifying culture, or at least especially given our, or with our met methodology, first finding an arbitrarily drawn border. That hopefully, uh, I'm, I'm already done with that. <laughs> that was my story. Hopefully, uh, hopefully at the beginning, that, that's the idea, is that this is a fairly arbitrarily drawn border. All right, this is um, why, so in fact, we didn't start by going into Romania and then thinking about other things. We, we um, as a very, very quick background, since we are pushed for time, my co-author has a paper where she, she had a um, regression discontinuity. I saw her present it and then had this idea that, because there probably, I think there were some problems that namely, you know, it solves some things, but there are other problems with it. So I had this idea that maybe we could find a place along this border that where, where, the, where the, uh, the border was not. Exogenous or endogenous. Now, the second thing you, you have to solve is all right, it's one thing for there to be a reasonably exogenous border, but there also have to be a reason you might believe there could be differences on the other side that are generated by the border, or at least not by the, you know, by the border, but things associated with either side of the border. And that's something that I'll talk about in a second. Why we might think that there are, re and this we're going to just rely on a literature, for, historical literature for that. And finally, um, and I'll go through this very quickly, that more modern differences are not going to be the cause. So, key to key to finding this arbitrarily drawn border is not only does it have to be arbitrarily drawn, but preferably it's not going to exist today. Because if it exists today, if this was 
you know, between Moldova and Romania or something. Well, you have a lot of different institutions between those countries. You have a whole host of different things going on. The, the beauty of this thing, or of this commune, is that they've all been, been under the same institutions for about a century now. So we can say that it, you know, if, we, if we're, we find some pretty stark differences, it's probably not more modern institutions that are driving these. Again, I can say probably. Now, of course, we might think culture is going to feed into very localized institutions. But on the other hand, you know, the institute, most of the relevant institutions, at least for, you know, at, at the you know, political and economic, are all commune level. So they all share a lot of, you know, a lot of political institutions in particular. All right, so just going quickly to this challenge number two, because uh, challenge number one, arbitrarily drawn border, I've already discussed. Now, we might think, or we need to find some type of border that in order to, to employ this methodology, that we might think drove some type of cultural differences. And here we're just going to rely on a pretty big literature, uh, or a fair, you know, recent literature. So um, Sasha Be Becker and colleagues have a paper recently where they look at the entire kind of border between the Habsburg Empire and other empires, mainly the Ottoman Empire, and run a regression discontinuity and find some pretty um, convincing results. To, so namely, what they find, or what they, they look for, and they still find some evidence today that this stuff has persisted, is that you know, the Habsburgs, while rapacious, you know, were, they, they were by no means you know, this angelic group of people that, that treated everyone great, but relative to their Ottoman and Russian neighbors had a relatively well-functioning bureaucracy, at the very least. And that, you know, there's a pretty large literature on it being relatively corruption-free. This is kind of, you know, what this literature states. Whereas the Ottoman and Russians, you know, were, were known for, you know, being somewhat autocratic, having a relatively rapacious administration, especially starting in the, the late 17th century under the Ottoman Empire, where um, tax, the tax farming institutions became quite rapacious. Um, now, what we're going to do is now to kind of bring it back to a lot of the stuff that's been uh, discussed already today, is that we're going to you know, th think through what this means for not just trust, but this kind of in-group versus out-group trust. Because all of these administrators that they were dealing with were all outsiders. And now historically, wh what we can say especially about this group is that this, you know, w this is a testable, a testable hypothesis that we, <laughs> we're going to try to test is that this not, not just should affect trust, but specifically trust of outsiders. Now, maybe it affects generalized trust as well. And what we'll be able to test, you know, that's part of what we're going to be thinking. But we also, we're also going to specifically be looking at in-group versus out-group trust. Because if this history actually matters, in a sense, for, for affecting trust, we just expect it to affect trust of outsiders, maybe more generally. And again, there's a lot of different ways this could go, but all of this is testable. So it's an empirical question. All right, and then we can say, all right, do these differences, again, did they, did they, do they exist in the present day? Are, is culture that sticky that it, can, that it can overcome all of these? Again, remember, th this group has been, you know, this, this commune has been under the same governance, same everything for about 100 years. So might we expect to see these differences that might have been generated in the past? Of, you know, there was no world va value survey in the, the 18th century, but that we suspect could have been generated in the past. Indeed, the, the rest of the literature s does suggest that there are differences, perhaps, across the board. Can we see this on the, on the micro level? All right, so finally, I'm just, I've already noted this, you know, having something, you know, this, that we suspect more modern stuff is not driving. That's what we've already noted. All right, so what we do is we run trust games with villagers in the commune. What they did was they played they played with co-villagers and outsiders, and all the outsiders were people from the other village, um, or one of the other villages. Um, now, what we did was we have, so unfortunately, we own, there is only one village on the, on the not, what we'll call non-Austrian side, so we could only play with one village, but we did play with two on the Austrian side, which kind of permits a treatment in a control group. So, you know, in, in some cases, we have Austrians playing where the outsiders are the other side, literally the other side of that old border. We also have Austrians playing where you know, it's on the, on the opposite side of the same border. And it also, it also allows us to say, like, look, maybe, you know, and, and, and one criticism of this, which is, you know, which is fair, but I think is, is also when you consider the broader literature on this, it, which is consistent, is that, like, you know, there are three villages at the, at the end of the day. If there's something highly idiosyncratic that th there's no reason to believe there is, but highly idiosyncratic in one of these villages, it might drive this. Well, what, what having at least two on the Austrian side 
gives us is that if these two are acting the same and it's differently than this, you know, this at, at the very minimum is consistent with our ex ante hypothesis. And we're going to get into some ways to break this down. All right, so very quick, just because I'm almost certainly not going to have enough time, these are the main results. The first main result and the main result, or actually, no, the, the, the main result is are really the first two big bullet points. On the one hand, subjects on the Austrian side did have greater trust of outsiders. That's precisely what we predicted. But it gets a little more interesting than that. It's not, so this is, this is not, and, and by, when I say in the control group, this is means, you know, the, the, between, if we just compare the two Austrian towns, they, there's no difference. But this is actually not totally true in that it's actually a subset of the people on the Austrian side that had greater trust of outsiders, and it's those whose grandparents were from the village. So if we compare on either side, and on this we actually got a little lucky in that, you know, by, by nature we couldn't run this on too many people because these are small towns, but there were enough people where we can get statistical power that both had grandparents and didn't have grandparents. Um, so this is something we had you know, originally thought to look at, and I, I was actually surprised how, just how strong the results ended up being. But if we're thinking of some type of vertical transmission mechanism, you know, it actually, you know, it could be horizontal, but vertical is a little, I think, easier to interpret here. This is precisely what we might expect, is that those people who you know, either lived with People, you know, his grandparents might have lived under this regime, because actually it turns out that our, our average age was about 40. So if you, you know, if you had a grandparent that you either lived with or lived in the town, you, you were the one that, that drove this result. People whose grandparents are not from the town did not. All right. Um, okay, so very quickly, experiment. This is a lab in the field trust game. We have these two Austrian towns, two non-Austrian towns. The only thing that was different between any of the, the experiments was who you played with. So we told them at the beginning, you are playing with somebody from Udeshti, you're playing. So we, this is actually might be a little confusing. Udeshti is both a, a town and the name of the commune as a whole. Um, the identity or your, your specific identity of your partner or the experiment was not known. Um, the game went like this. So they, all they had to do was circle 0, 1, 2, or 3, how many they wanted to give. Um, and this, this was one token was like 75 cents US. Um, yeah, this was translated in Romanian, of course. Um, that, so, and it was all done by paper. So they, all they had to do was circle this when they played as a sender. So everyone played as both sender and receiver. When you're a receiver, you, you had to play strategy method. You had to fill a conditional out on zero, one, two. Well, you didn't, we circled this for them. Conditional on your partner sending you one, two, or three. How much are you going to return? because it's multiplied by three. So, so the way it works is you, know, you, you send one, two, or three, or zero, one, two, or three, that's multiplied by three. So that's kind of the, the, the idea of how, yeah, then the other person is going to return a certain amount to you. Okay? So in the, the experimental literature, the first decision, the send decision, is kind of viewed as trust, how much, because you're trusting that this person is going to send back. This is a decision that's kind of interpreted as trustworthiness in the literature, how much you know, how, how trustworthy are you? How much are you actually going to send back? Okay, so again, we only have a total of 400 subjects, um, and that said, about one-third of households in these three towns um, participated. Now, another downside to this is I don't think this experiment is replicable in this commune because everyone knows about it now, and they almost certainly talked about it that day. Um, and uh, so, you can maybe re replicate it somewhere else where there's a random border assignment. Um, and we switched it around. So what we did is we had them play with each other and then with, the, uh, and then with, someone, then with somebody from the opposite side of the border. Um, and we switched it around to control for order effects. Um, and they, in, in each of these settings, they would have played twice, once as a sender and once as a receiver, with somebody from their own town and with somebody from across the border or on their own side. Um, there is more or less balance across villages. We had, a, um, I think we did fairly well on this again, as I see, you know, these are you know, people of all age. Uh, you, had to, you had to be 16 to participate, um, but the average age was in the 40s. Um, both in the, uh, that, so that was the treatment group. 
treatment and control group look pretty similar. You know, most of these people are Eastern Orthodox, about half of a high school education. Um, we had a, re a research firm, it's a couple of PhD sociologists that have some, so, some uh, survey and uh, field experiment track record located in Bucharest um, implement these for us. We had a ton of <laughs> Skype conversations with them. Um, they, so we, you know, they knew everything about doing this. They, you know, they, they have experience with trust games. They had no idea why we picked this commune and we didn't tell them and that was very purposeful because you know, we didn't want any, anything. You know, that we wanted to be you know, truly double blind in that way. Um, you know, fortunately for us, the weather was beautiful that day so they had a huge turnout. Um, this was, a secondary school in one of the three locations, and this is them setting up. Uh, it's kind of this. I mean, this is a nicer school than my daughter's school for sure. Um, <laughs> in rural Romania, um, so um, they they would go 20 to 30 people in a room at a time and read everything in Romanian, you know, and answer questions only about clarification. Very similar. I mean, this is very similar to how experiments would be run in a lab in the U.S. for college students as well. On the day of the experiment. You received your show up fee, which was $2.50. Because of the nature of the experiment, you were sometimes playing with people from the other village, and it was done on paper. We couldn't pay them at the time. But what they did is they came back one week later, to, so they did it in three consecutive days. And then one week later, three consecutive days, they, 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 um, they paid everyone their earnings. You know, we, we had to pay them the two fifty dollars originally to you know, show them we're for real, we're not just getting this data and then leaving. And then, but, but logistically, we could not pay them on, on, on the day. So we had to do it and make sure that, you know, for time discount reasons, that it was, you know, the same with each one. So again, I've already said this, but this was double blind in the sense that they had no idea why we were doing this. Um, all right, so very quickly, um, prediction one is or the, the main, and this is the main prediction, and I'm not going to be able to go over all, through all the specifics of everything we find. But what we're expecting is, you know, participants from the non-Austrian side are going to spend, are going to send less when playing with outsiders, okay, than the people on the Austrian side. This is, you know, the, the fundamental idea behind the, uh, this, this whole literature as a whole, but particularly our experiment. Now, that doesn't look good for that, you know, th these, there's no differences, you know, it's anything close to statistic, statistically significant. So what I, whenever I show you these, this will be the treatment side, this is the control group where you have you you know, this is the non, the Austrian side rather, uh, non-Austrian side, Stirbot, Austrian, Austrian. Okay, so this is what I was kind of noting before, that on the one hand, as a as a whole, you don't, you can't, you don't really see any differences here. However, and I'm skipping to prediction three because prediction three informs this. Let's maybe think about, all right, so what we did is we, you know, we have this post-survey, uh, post-experiment survey. We asked them a bunch of questions. One thing particularly you know, that I was most interested in is their history in the village. Do they have, did their parents, are their parents from the village? Are their grandparents from the village? They have, are their great-grandparents from the village? Some of them obviously didn't know that. Um, but what we might be thinking of is, all right, maybe this is, maybe a subset of, of people, and it ends up being, you know, we, we, ha we do have enough a high enough end here for it to gain some statistical power. Maybe the people that have a history in the village are acting a little differently than the people that are not from the village, or at least have some type of history in the village or more recent to the village. And if we, you know, and I think everyone in this room certainly believes that, you know, there's so, that, that you know, culture can be transmitted intergenerationally, then we might expect to see differences between these two groups of people. Now here's what we see when we see, uh, when we look at the amount sent to outsiders if your grandparents are from the village or not. Now, you know, this, this is the control group. This looks a little different, but this is not even close to statistically different. This is highly statistically different. So what we're seeing here is about, you know, about a 25% difference in the amount sent to outsiders in the treatment group in, in the way we expected, in the sense that you know, people from the non-Austrian side, you know, the Ottoman Russian side, are sending you know, significantly less, only if their grandparents are from the village. Grandparents not from the village, indistinguishable. All right, and again, the, the end here is you know, anywhere between about 30 to 60, depending on which, which specific one you're looking at, and it's a little, yeah. Um, 
All right, so the result here is, and this is just you know, some of the statistical tests. So yeah, it is right around 50%. So the, this is kind of the key difference right here. This are the numbers I just showed you, but the actual numbers. And the p-value is you know, quite high. So namely, if you had grandparents from Udeshti, or from you know, the, the Austrian side, on average, you'd send two, two out of your three to uh, outsiders. Whereas if you were, had grandparents from the non-Austrian side, Shabbat, you sent about a one and a half. All right, so again, the idea here, you know, one thing we are finding is you know, consistent with our ex-ante hypothesis, and even, you know, kind of with a sub-hypothesis, that if we focus, we actually, we actually were just expecting this to may, maybe be a little stronger, but not actually give us any statistical significance. But it turns out this is, you know, the entire result, is that it's those with uh, family from the, the region. All right, so, um, I do want to leave a little bit of time for, uh, for um, questions, so I'll just sh show you some of this. So what we, what we find, so our, with, with respect to sending to co-villagers, we thought that that was a little less clear because there's two, there's two countervailing things that might be going on here. One is that what we're calling trust of outsiders might just be generalized trust. It might make, it might make the non-Austrian side less trustworthy. On the other hand, there's also a literature, so like you know, Avner Greif has a paper that looks at you know when you have when you have groups like this that that don't trust outsiders you really have to trust your inside group you know then this is that's you know the economic history literature there's a large literature on in group versus out group trust and where you don't you know so we don't know wh which way it's going to go now if we look to outsiders this is exactly what we'd expect to find so this these are ordered probits you know, on how much you sent and I'm only I'm only focusing for the sake of of a 40 minute presentation on how much you sent. We also analyze the return decisions here. But this is precisely what we find. You know, there's nothing, so Stierbot against the non, or the non Austrian side, there's nothing unique about Stierbot in terms of how much you send. But if you have grandparents from Stierbot, you're sending a lot less. Now, what we also find is that indeed they send more to co villagers. And this, this, is, not, um, this is not something that is just um, uh, for those people who have grandparents from the village tends to be as a whole, all right? Um, again, so if we look at the, the control group, the top or this line, not, the, these are the two that are, you know, village, nothing significant, which is, you know, again, what we would be hoping for in the sense that if we, if we want to at least go down the path of ruling out something idiosyncratic in these villages, that's what we'd hope for. Um, um, I'm going to skip the result because this, this takes too long to, uh, go through and I want to leave a couple minutes for questions. I think maybe I'll just leave on a few concluding thoughts and something that I'm interested in more generally as an economic historian. You know, our results are now you know, in line with this, especially within economics, even though this is something anthropologists and others have known for a long time, that, you know, culture is sticky. And it, what our results are suggesting is that, especially even in this small environment, you know, very localized environment, in an environment that has had common economic and political institutions for about a century, these cultural differences have remained. Or at least, are to, you know, this is, what our, this is what our results at least indicate. And when we're thinking as economists then, man, you know, the, the role that this might be playing and how it interacts and maybe even counteracts institutions is something that I think economists and you know, others need to, need to consider. A little more. All right. So, I think what I have like three minutes. Is that? Yeah, we've got three and a half minutes. Excellent. So, any questions for Jared? So, just to be clear, I'm going to like be a um, occupation trader to anthropologists, but you're suggesting that in 140 years or something like that, they acquired this cultural trait, but in 100 years they couldn't erase it, right? So, there's is that right? Like, there's a bit yeah, of yeah, yeah. symmetry there, in terms, especially given that like, the hundred years are. So, so, I, so it kind of, yeah. So I would say it's not that they acquired it in those 140 years. I think it was probably acquired because this entire area was Ottoman for a long time and had been actually kind of traded back and forth and, and actually since there was really settlement in the area. So I think that we might think of it as rather acquiring kind of that almost being the starting condition. And one side for 140 years has been 
maybe pushing against or had kind of had a head start maybe on on changing towards a more trusting area. But you're, yeah, you're, you're. I mean, I think you're you're right on that. That <laughs> yeah, 140 long time ago versus a recent hundred um, maybe shouldn't. Yeah, what would yeah. Uh, well, yeah, I I think it is an amazing paper. <laughs> no, I, I, yeah, no, I agree. I agree. I agree. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Uh, um, uh, uh, sh- yeah. So uh, so here you're talking about uh, trusted outsiders, but the historical uh, context you're describing is actually trust in. Uh, government or in officials or in administration. And these are not exactly the same things, right? Of course, yes, of course. Um, so did you do some in the post experiment survey, did you ask something like trust in government? Yes. Trust in, and did you find anything? Um, there, there are slight differences. Um, but one thing that we found is a lot, it, a lot of the non-incentivized trust, so we asked them, you know, trust in all of that, the government stuff, and also just also trust in outside, you know, trust in people from the other villages. The non-incentivized stuff all went in the direction that we found, but not, it wasn't really that different, you know, and, and I, I also tend to think that, and this is maybe the economist me, that, you know, the incentivized stuff is more credible, but yeah, we did ask them that. It goes in the direction, but it's just not that strong. So, it's, it's also, yes. Yeah, it's, uh, very interesting. My question is, did you also look at, you know, we have four grandparents, so... Uh-huh. Is, is, uh, yeah, I, 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 wish, I wish we had asked them that question. We just asked grandparents. So we actually don't, e- so one thing in retrospect, we don't even know is whether, you know, how that question was interpreted for, uh, we believe for the, mo- the way it was asked. The most natural interpretation would just be one, one grandparent. But yeah, you're right. I, mean, I wish we had asked them that question. Um, yes. So you, you kind of mentioned that culture is sticky. Right? Yep. We know lots of examples where culture uh, swings with the blink sure. of an eye. And so do you have any thoughts about what makes, what kinds of culture are sticky <laughs> or what makes sticky and not sticky? Um, I have thoughts. I don't think we can, you know, I don't, not, not in the context of this yeah. paper. I mean, I think that, you know, what, what, you know, what the literature, I mean, I, and you guys, and there's plenty of people in this room that would know this better than I. Yeah, certain types of you know trusting behavior, I think, is a, is a little stickier than others. That's something that at least is is hard to undermine. Um, yeah, but but big you know really big events you know can I think as you're suggesting can shift things rather quickly. This little village in Romania did not you know it wasn't like a, a theater of World War II or anything. Yeah, it experienced communism, but it wasn't. One thing we wanted was it, to find a place that was kind of boring. Because I think you're right. I mean, if, if you find a place that's a little too active, yeah, I mean, you're, you know, you're probably going to find stuff that can switch in the blink of an eye. Is that Larry, do you have? Uh, I wonder if you've thought much about the underlying mechanism here. It's, it's, I mean, it, it sounds to me like you found an aspect of culture, trust, or whatever, in this form that is rooted in family. It's kind of hard to imagine that this has to do just with some general institutions that you're interacting with in the way the nature of these, these communities. The, uh, that, I think that's the mechanism. Con- yeah, I mean, certainly the mechanism connect, that, that has to be our story. That the mechanism connecting the history to today can't be the institutions. Pers- I mean, that, that we tried to find an, inst- uh, an environment where it, wa- it, where it couldn't be institutions because they have more or less the same institutions. Now, you're talking about the mechanism for the initial difference or the transmission well, mechanism? The transmission has yeah. to be really tightly tied to family. Yeah. Or, yeah. It, it's, yeah, that, that's, what, that's what you mean by, I mean, that, that is what we mean by vertical transmission. I mean, that, that's, that, that was our ex ante that we were trying to get at. Yeah. I, I, so yes, I mean that, that's def, I mean that's in fact one of the reasons we did this is to try to get at something that's a little better at getting at the trans, the, the the transmission cost. Our time is up. Thank you, Jared. Thank you.